Today on the Home Winemaking Channel, we're gonna make an epic yeast starter, and we're gonna talk about some reasons why your wine might struggle to get started. If you like videos like this, make sure to subscribe below, swing by my website, smartwinemaking.com for more content, and for even more bonus content support on Patreon. There's a wide array of ways that you could add yeast to a wine and probably be successful from the simplest being just to sprinkle that yeast on the top to the more complex yeast starters that are just gonna give you a much more high success rate. And that's what we're gonna talk about today. Now, the yeast starter that I'm gonna make is for a decent sized batch of wine. It's gonna be for about a um, 30 gallon batch. So as a general rule of thumb, you're gonna wanna use about one gram of yeast per gallon of must that you're starting. And that's a pretty loose rule. So if you're starting a red wine, usually your pH is gonna be a little bit higher. So it's gonna be a little bit less acidic, a little bit less harsh on that yeast. And the thing about starting a red wine from grapes is that yeast starter will sit right on the top, right in the air like it wants. So for a red wine, especially if you're getting into a bigger batch, you can kind of lean a little bit towards less than a gram per gallon. Now the opposite I consider to be true for a more acidic wine, like a crisp white wine, or maybe you're doing something like a Concord wine from the Great Lakes region. When you get into these more acidic wines, if you've got the yeast to spare, I always like to make a little bit more of a, call it a heavy starter. So I might do one and a quarter grams per gallon, or if I'm only making three gallons, I might just go ahead and double it and do six grams of yeast for that little batch. And it's not like you're adding a chemical to the wine. You could add 10 times if you wanted to. It's not gonna really make a difference. You're just trying to establish a yeast colony in that wine that will basically take off and start multiplying its own self. If I add two grams of yeast to a wine, you can be sure that by the time it's done, we're gonna have hundreds of grams. It's just multiplying like crazy once it establishes. The yeast that I'm using today is BDX, and this is a red wine yeast that's been isolated from France. And you'll notice I say isolated. A lot of people think that these yeasts are some, you know, ninja GMO thing that has no place being in a wine. But the reality is most of the yeasts that you're gonna find on the shelf are yeasts that are found naturally in the wild that these companies like Scott Labs and White Labs, um, they'll isolate these strains that we found to make good wine or they're from good wine regions. And for me, that's gonna be a lot better than whatever wild native yeast I might have in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania here, which is not traditionally a premium wine growing region. To help kind of build up that yeast before adding it to the wine, you wanna make sure it's ultra super healthy. And one way to, to do that is to use GoFirm. So this is pretty common whether you're making a yeast starter for beer or for wine. And what GoFirm does is it provides micronutrients to that yeast without providing that massive nitrogen hit that they're gonna get with a traditional yeast nutrient like diammonium phosphate, the ammonium salts. If you were to add traditional yeast nutrient meaning the ammonium salts to a yeast starter, it's, it can be a little bit toxic to that yeast at those ultra high doses that they would be getting. So stick to the things like GoFirm, or if you don't wanna use GoFirm, you don't really need it, but it will just help assure that you're gonna have a good clean start to that yeast, and that yeast is gonna stay healthy throughout that fermentation reducing the likelihood that you're gonna to have to really push a lot of nitrogen at it during the fermentation. So because we're using GoFirm, we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna use 17 milliliters of water per gram of yeast that we're using. And we're gonna get that water pretty warm. So about 100 to 105 degrees Fahrenheit is nice and warm. It'll really help accelerate this whole process of getting this little bit of yeast that you put in to multiply to a nice, big, substantial yeast starter. 
I really like to mix my yeast starters and my things like go firm on a magnetic stir plate. This is a Hanna. I want to say this is about a hundred dollars. I'll put a link to this exact stir plate in the description. The stir plate for one, it helps to mix up these chunkier things like go firm, which is really, really difficult to mix, but it also, in the case of a yeast starter, helps aerate that yeast, which helps accelerate that reproduction or asexual reproduction that yeast likes to do. So yeast in the presence of oxygen will do what's called respiration versus your alcoholic fermentation. And during the respiration process, the yeast is more likely or more easily multiplies and also is able to recover energy a lot better than when it's in the absence of oxygen. Once you've got your go firm nice and dissolved in your warm water, we'll go ahead and we'll sprinkle our yeast into there. And if you're using a stir plate, sprinkle it in while you've got your little vortex. And from here, we can walk away for a little bit. I'm gonna walk away for about 15 minutes and I'm gonna come back and check on it. At 15 minutes, what you would do per the standard go firm instructions is just pour that yeast starter into the wine or into the wine must, but I like to take it a little bit further. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add a little bit of my must into the starter. And what that's gonna do is kind of help reduce the shock that that starter is gonna get as it goes into the wine. So the reason it's gonna often get a little bit shocked is you often have a big temperature difference from your yeast starter to your must and you also have a pretty big acid difference and also a big sugar difference. So you kind of want to get that yeast starter acclimated to the environment that it's going to see in that wine must. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to add about one third of your volume in just wine must. And if you get a few berries in there, if this is a red wine, don't worry about it. Let them go and it's not going to be a problem. And then we're going to walk away again, stop back in about 20 minutes. At this point, 20 minutes later, so we're about 35 minutes into the process, you're going to look at your little starters. Every yeast behaves a little bit differently, so if that starter is foaming out of control, at this point, I'll say you can add it to your must. But I, I will caution, you want to make sure that that yeast starter is within, within about 10 degrees Fahrenheit of the wine must. So that means you might want to let it sit and cool a little bit. You, I'm not going to tell you to warm up your giant wine must to try to meet the temperature of the starter. You're going to try to get the starter to the wine must temperature within 10 degrees. And when you are adding a yeast starter, you're going to want that must to be ideally about 70 degrees up to about 75. That's a nice lukewarm temperature really helps get things started for you. If you find that your yeast starter is behaving pretty nicely, it's not foaming out of control and really roaring, you can go ahead and add a little bit more of that must or juice to the starter. And again, I'll add about a third again, the volume. And this time I'm gonna walk away again for about 20 minutes and we'll stop back. So what you should see at this point is a couple of things. One, uh, you could see, like I said, a lot of foaming. If you stop your stir plate, you'll often hear, if you listen, you'll just kind of hear a lot of fizzing, which is exactly what you want to hear. Uh, you should see the, the kind of texture of that starter is kind of milky and cloudy and thick. And that's because you're just ultra multiplying that yeast. So. You've got a huge cell count if you're making a yeast starter like this. And at this point, we're gonna call it ready to add to the wine. When I add my yeast starter to the wine, a lot of people might really stir it in, but for that first 12 hours, I actually like to let that yeast starter sit on the top surface of the wine, which is really easy with red wine because the grapes kind of just stop it from pushing too deep into the must. With a white wine, when you pour the starter in, you'll often see it kind of mix pretty readily. It's not a big deal. It's probably gonna start without a hitch. But if it doesn't start, let's talk about some reasons why. So you're gonna know if your yeast didn't start 
if you know you give it say 12 hours maybe 16 hours and you're just not seeing any activity yet with a red wine with grapes you'll see those grapes you'll kind of hear them kind of crackling away in there and eventually start to see them float a little bit up from the surface if you push a punch down tool into it you'll see the the kind of some more bubbles coming out as you're doing that. So that's an indication that it's started. In a white wine or a wine without actual grapes in it, you'll kind of see just a little, sometimes foam, sometimes not foam, but usually just some indication that there are some bubbles happening. I find white wines to be substantially harder to get started than red wines. And especially if you're buying juice so there's some places you can go they'll pull a spigot and you can get some white wine juice which is great but um, it can make for sometimes a difficult start and the reasons why are often that juice can be pretty heavily sulfited because they don't want that juice to start fermenting away in their big bulk storage tank so if that's the case i mean you can go ahead and run a sulfite test but it's not that necessary. You can just let that wine sit for another 24 hours and what will happen is those sulfites will start to react and your free SO2 will drop, making it much, much easier for that yeast to start. For white wines too, usually the pH is substantially lower, meaning way higher acid. So you combine a little bit of sulfur dioxide SO2 with, um, a pretty pretty low pH it's just a pretty harsh environment so it's a little bit tricky to get that yeast going the number one thing that will help you get your yeast started in a situation whether it be that um, or just you're just trying to make sure that it starts easier is going to be the temperature I mentioned 70 to 75 and even if you're going to ferment a white wine cool which I generally recommend doing I'll still heat it up to close to 70, low 70s to assure that that yeast is gonna start. Cause sometimes what can happen is you can make a nice yeast starter and you know, in a, in a sort of harsh white wine environment, it, it just might not take the first time. So you might find a day or day and a half later, you're doing it again and it's just, wasting yeast really and some of these yeasts come out a bit of a cost like two dollars <laughs> so it's not that big of a deal but if you don't have the yeast it could be a big problem because you you might have had the one yeast that you want now you're using a different yeast because you just can't get the other yeast in time and for that reason if you are going to buy a less common yeast that you can't get locally um, what I would recommend is always buying more than you need, just in case. <laughs> in case you can't get that, that wine to start right away and you don't want to have to go to your general purpose yeast when you thought you were going to have some kind of fancy yeast. I'll throw a little bonus in this episode. Some things I look for when I'm choosing a yeast, it's, it's going to be a lot different than a beer where the the esters and the smells from the yeast contribute so much to the character of that beer. With a wine being aged so long before it's drank, you're not gonna get as much of that. But what you do want is a nice, reliable, healthy fermentation. For a red wine, you might even want a little bit of a slower fermentation so that you can just maximize that skin time and you know, you might not want a yeast that when you ramp up your temperature in that fermentation, it just rips through fermentation and finishes quickly. So you want a yeast, first of all, that can work within the temperature window that you want to ferment in. So if you're fermenting a white wine or apple wine or whatever, you might want to ferment at 55 degrees Fahrenheit. Well, not all yeasts really enjoy that temperature. So make sure that your yeast is okay with the temperature that you want to ferment at. Next, I really like to choose a yeast that is a low hydrogen sulfide producer. 
This usually also means it's a low sulfite producer because yeast will actually produce a little bit of sulfite. So everybody out there that's super anti-sulfite, just know your yeast is producing a little bit of SO2 on its own. So it's in there. I also want a yeast that is a low volatile acidity producer. So volatile acidity, VA, is going to be your things like the volatile aromas like um, vinegar, uh, acetaldehyde, there's some isoamyl acetate. There's a few of these kind of volatile smells that they, in ultra low doses, can sometimes smell fruity, but in high doses, they just don't smell like something that you want in a wine. So generally, I want a, a yeast that's going to produce low. That's why I have this BDX yeast. Um, for my white wines, almost, I would say, eight out of ten times, I use a yeast called Renaissance Fresco, which is really hard to buy. I wish some of the bigger online retailers would offer it. There's one place that I've found it and I can't remember the website right now, so I'll put that link in the description as well. It is a no hydrogen sulfide producing wine. It cannot produce hydrogen sulfide. And that is super awesome when you're dealing with a delicate white wine because if you produce a little hydrogen sulfide on a white wine, you can end up with a it just taking over the taste of that wine. So it, hydrogen sulfide breaks down into mercaptan, which is this burnt rubber, not good thing that a wine can have. And some wines like your Sauvignon Blancs, that's a characteristic that some wineries can be okay with. Personally, I don't like it at all. I don't want it anywhere near my white wines. So something to think about. I think that I covered the things that you're gonna to wanna to know to make a yeast starter and the things that you're gonna to want to know to try to figure out why your wine didn't start or try to just maximize the possibility that that fermentation started. If, if I missed something or if you have any questions, make sure to write it in the comments section below. Once again, thanks for watching, guys.